was a little bit nervous about scheduling a talk on the very last day of classes, um, so I think I neglected to take into account the Ojibwe lingo factor. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it's great to see such a big turnout uh, to help us celebrate the end of the year of uh, lots of talk and activities. And uh, for those who haven't been to a think talk before, we try to run the talk itself roughly 45 minutes and then have roughly the same amount of time for q and I'm aware that some people here are planning to leave early to go to another event <laughs> that's occurring on campus. So uh, talk should go about 45 minutes. Um, I'll start the Q&A by seeing if anybody who needs to leave early has a question, uh, and then we'll sort of keep going from there. And without any further ado, I'll hand things over to my colleague, Jim and Thank you. Does anyone not have a handout that was a? Yeah. All right, so I'll start taking this round. Actually. You can go ahead. So. Anyway, thank you very much, uh, David, for this, for the introduction. And uh, I am so grateful to see uh, many students here and friends, many friends, which is wonderful. I mean, uh, and also the fact that this is the end of the semester and you have students here. And also, uh, at this time of the day, and you have people from Boulder here, really come to support the idea that Boulder is the brainy capital of, of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, for that reason, you know, when you talk to people that are uh, brainy, you have to do it right. And, you know, so, uh, I would like to start with an epigram here. <coughs> and my, my observation is that we are living in the age where ordinary human beings have an upper hand. And it's matter how they use the upper hand to resolve the age old problem of power as domination. So, ordinary people, for the first time, uh, I don't say the first time, I mean, for maybe for the past 200 years, they've had, they've had the power or they have the upper hand. And they've been struggling to see what to do with that power. And this, uh, what I'm going to talk about today will be one way of uh, uh, saying in my own little way what they could do with that power. And I also start with an epigram of my own. A good political philosophy is a better biography. So this will be snippets of my biography, this talk that we are having today. Uh, few today in the Western world have seen their world collapse before them from unthinkable, brutal human violence. Those who experience uh, this break of history, this censura of life, may find out that from that day on, they are no longer the same person, or they are no longer the same person. They may be forced to look into themselves. And if they do, they may discover resources in them that they never knew existed. I look on helplessly as the brutal killing of people and wanton destruction of their property, I feel the foundation on which my life was constructed splintered into a thousand pieces. I feel in me a grief without pain, a grief without a path. I entitled this presentation In the Shade of Power because I want to highlight the centrality of power and the political power for anyone who wants to make sense of his or her political work. Talking about central liberal democratic uh, concepts such as liberty, such as equality, justice, individuality, free enterprise, private property, and opportunities, without connect them to, connecting them to power is like making a sacrifice with a headless chicken. Without a head, these concepts are worse than useless. At best, they are sort of toy concepts. 
When I sat down with his majesty, the phone or the king of so, and his courtiers, and in the service of publicity, this is my, uh, my brother, and explained Rome's theory of justice to them. They all agreed after careful consideration that it sounded like the justice of the chicken and the cockroaches. <laughs> chicken eat cockroaches, even if they plead innocent. In fact, that's the reason why they eat cockroaches in the first place. That is how, when you, when you take away power and you explain this concept, that's the way they sound like. Talking about central liberal democratic uh, 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 in the 21st century, let me just go down to what power is. In the 21st century, power is what human being cannot help but be. Is what human being cannot help but be. And I'll come back to this uh, round delay many times. Power implies a hierarchy in which some people control other people's bodies, their sex, and possessions. Deciding who to kill, who to spare, who should have sex with, and when. This is what on a dawn or naked power looks like. Whether it's political or not, it's about control or domination of people's sex life. Deciding who to have sex with, or who to have sex with who. Deciding what to possess and human life, what to control, that is what power is at the best and nothing else. Uh, my view is that we do not abolish the hierarchy created by power and on which power depends by leveling down people at the top so everyone is as if on the same plateau. In the case of contemporary Africa, the cry has been and is and always is to bring down the president perceived as tyrant. That this is the case in Africa can be gleaned from these exhibits. Exhibit one, there are 55 sovereign nations in Africa. Of those 55, 44 have experienced military coup d'etat leaving aside Cameroon, Morocco, and Kenya, which experienced attempted coup, but none of them succeeded. Syria coup states, like Central African Republic and Burkina Faso, have not done better than the rest of the states, where, where coup occurred not as often. Botswana, South Africa, Cape Verde, Malawi, Namibia, Eritrea, and Mauritius are the only African nations which have never experienced a military coup or attempted military coup. It is questionable that these states are doing better than the rest of African states broadly construed. Exhibit two, the focus of the so-called Arab Spring was to level down the leaders they conceive as tyrants. Mubarak must go, Gaddafi must go, Bin Ali must go, and go they have. They have all gone. If anything has changed, it is for the worst. Exhibit three, election is all about leveling down everyone, one man, one woman, one vote. The rise of democratic elections in Africa since 1990 is undeniable. Despite the, this popularity, one party rule is still the norm in Africa. Even with highly rated democracies, democracies like South Africa, and, and uh, Botswana. It is undeniable that elections become the means for demagogues to grab power, or more typically for powerful elites and authoritarian rulers to entrain themselves. Mind you, this is not an argument against election. It is just an observation. The rhetorical question is this. Is life better for an average individual African for these measures that has been taken to level down their leaders. Purifying African state by failed attempt at leveling down tyrants to the level of all else in the name of democracy has not succeeded and is not likely to succeed 
anytime soon or even ever. In fact, any attempt at bringing down dictators has only helped to lead Africans down the nightmarish widening gyre with no end in sight. For another, for another exhibit of failed attempt to take down tyrants, bear with me over this little long quote by Spinoza, though in a different context. At a time when all people of Syracuse desired the death of uh, Dionysus, a certain woman continually prayed that he would remain safe and sound and might outlive her. When the tyrant came to know of this, he asked her why she did it. She said to him, when I was a girl, we suffered the oppression of a tyrant, and I longed for his death, then he was slain. But his successor was even harsher, and I thought it a great thing when his rule came to an end. But then we began to have a third ruler who was even more savage, you. <laughs> And if you were to be taken away from us, someone still worse would come instead. This unnamed woman tells the story of contemporary African states. With notable, but all too few exceptions, Afri African governments are unresponsive to their people's needs. It often seems that the only alternative to repressive government is an even more brutal chaos. It sometimes happens that the help of a foreign nation is enlisted as happened in Ivory Coast and Egypt and, and Libya to take down a tyrant and fearing that another will do to him what he has done to others, he become even worse than his predecessors because among other things, he is also beholden to foreign power. For fear that some of you may think that this is all about Africa, let me provide some exhibit from the Western world as well. The cradle of modern democracy in Athens came about with a leveling down of monarchy in the same plateau as everybody else, and that's when they have citizens. Even though what we have, we are white male Athenians, but that was a very, that was a giant leap in the history of mankind, what happened in Athens. The United States was founded with the, with, the, with the ideal as penned down by Jefferson that all men, basically all humans, are created equal and should be so. The French Revolution of 1789 was about leveling down the monarchy. And let me, let me quote this so that it doesn't sound like this being made up somehow. Here is Edmund Burke, but now all is to be changed. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All moral imagination with the heart's own and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation uh, to be exploited as ridiculous, absurd, absurd and antiquated fashion by the new conquering empire of light and reason. In this scheme of things, a king is but a man. A queen is but a woman. A woman is but an animal, an animal not of the highest order. Another exhibit, Marxism was concerned, was centered on leveling down the bourgeoisie. In fact, the whole scheme of communism is centered around leveling down of people. There is a new cry that you hear today in big cities, level down billionaires, bring down billionaires. I submit that the flattening of, tomo of the topography of power through a single focus, through a single focus on leveling down leaders and billionaires is nothing but a fool's errand. <coughs> African dictators are not only alive and well, they are flourishing across the continent. One is brought down just to be replaced by another. Here is what I propose. We should not abolish the caste system. We should make everybody into a Brahmin. We do not abolish our royalty. We make every woman into a queen and every man into a prince. 
We should not bring down our billionaires. We should make everyone, everyone into a billionaire. A contoured, civic, a contoured civic topography is not only beautiful, it is moral and topophilic. In what follows, I, I, I analyze the structure of tyranny to, dem to demonstrate how we can democratize democracy in the 21st century by leveling individuals up, not down. And you can see the, the, the schema that I passed here. I call it a system of democratizing democracy because for the first time, I'm demonstrating how we should not try to change what human being cannot help but be. We are all power hungry agents. Should power perish, freedom will perish. We can have freedom, power, and equality at the same time. The exercise of power is a primary form of individual expression. In fact, it is what human being, I repeat, cannot help but be. Power gives the holder the pleasurable feeling of immortality and the institutions, the offices, and trappings on which it depends do not diminish. They enhance power. The pleasure of the exercise of power is akin to that of an infant for whom mortality is neither an applicable nor a useful concept. For an infant, as for Lucy, Lucy Descartes, life is here and now, and an infant as Lucy Descartes may as well be said to be living forever. The African present for life suffer from this infantilism. Let me demonstrate the art of leveling human beings up, not down. And you can look at the diagram that I, that I put forward here. And you see, uh, diagrammatically, the sword represents uh, positive power, and the shield represents negative power. And they look something like what you have here. Now, while the sword represents power to the sword represents power to do unto others as, as one judge fit. The shield represents the power against others doing unto one what one has done or is doing unto others. The power to is positive power and the power against is negative power. Negative power is, cent is central to human beings. It is even more important to tyrants than positive power. In fact, it is more important to tyrants. People will fight for power because of negative power, not necessarily positive power. For, for what is a prince? What is a princess? What is a queen? What is a noble? What is a president? A senator? But a bundle of harms that cannot be meted upon her. All things that she can do unto others, that others cannot do unto her, notwithstanding. <coughs> Notice that president in Africa lives in a, in a, in castle full of well trained bodyguards, and when they venture out, they do so in bulletproof cars, surround, surrounded by men ready to take the bullet for them. Their visit to another part of their own country is preceded is preceded by army on rooftops, hidden values, and so on, to fend off any attack from those who desire to do unto them what they've done to them or are doing to them. The juxtaposition of negative and positive power is what Church Hill might have had in mind when he said that dictators ride to and fro upon tigers from which they dare not dismount. Staying in power and terrorizing others are the Church Hill's tiger, tigers that dictators must ride to and fro because if they dare to dismount, they will not be given the luxury of dying by the gun. They must be publicly humiliated, forced to see their own mortality and be dispossessed of what they treasure most, immortality. Again, the worst fear for dictators is for others to do unto them what they do unto others. This is exactly what happened to Colonel Gaddafi, who was chased 
captured and shot on the head by ordinary young Libyans, he has terrorized for years. He is alleged to have begged his captive not to kill him. His last words were, and I was looking at this on television, what did I do to you? Even up to his death, Gaddafi believed he was invincible. For when, for when he asked them, don't you know right from wrong? When he asked them this question, he already taught them, taught the young boys the answer with his own life. In another contemporary example, Saddam Hussein was chased around, found hiding in a hole, captured, and then ceremoniously lynched before those he has terrorized for so long. In fact, there is nothing special about the brutal end to the lives of dictators except that, armed with cell phones, the world can now share the spectacle as, as uh, Mentifio recollects. There was something biblical in the wild scene, as elemental as the death of King Ahab. The dogs lick up his blood, and Queen Jezebel threw off the palace balcony. It was certainly not as terrible as the death of the Byzantine Emperor Andronicus the first, who was beaten and dismembered, his hair and teeth pulled out by the mob, his handsome face burned with boiling water. In modern time, it was more frenzied than the semi-formal execution in 1989 of Romanian dictator Nicole Sisiko. Ciacisco. But not as terrible as the ghastly lynching in 1958 of innocent King Faisal, the second of Iraq, age 23, and his hated uncle, who were supposedly impaled and dismembered, their heads used as soccer bombs. In 1996, the pro-Soviet former president of Afghanistan, Najibullah, was castrated, dragged through the street, and hung. That's, what, that's why any leader and dictators look for this negative power for the Shia. My view is that we leave positive power alone. It is a secret. It is the secret of our sacred ideal of freedom. We focus on negative power. We give each and every individual her own shade of power. The shade here represents negative power. That is my point that we should be leveling up everyone. Ngonso, the princess and my Matulina ancestors who founded the state of Zo, the state that Sayat made, was a hyper self-governing individual. The establishment of the government was so was to complement self-government, not to replace it. Ngonso said as much, the raison d'etre of our state and government is not to substitute, but to complement and enhance the control each has over her life. Ours is the government of, by, and for his or her own share of power. The oft-repeated saying at my home of so, which even a child can repeat at the least provoca at the slightest provocation, represents just one Gonzo or referring to as the best government. That is the government which everyone, including women, are self governing and each under her, her, her shield of power. Here is the saying. Uh, in my language, it says she you she the phone should be, which is uh, rendered, the mouse like uh, creature is like queen or king by its own tiny hole. Uh, the words for this epigram are carefully picked and stitched together. The mouse like creature is a tiny, very tiny creature which is supposed to be uh, defenseless against dictators, yet she is queen or king in her own tiny hole like house. How is, house is a literal house but also a metaphor for the spiritual way being that makes her inviolable and godly, and godly, not godly. The infinite, the infinitesimal size of her person and dwelling is not a warrant for incursion into her life by tyrants of any sort. 
It is, it is not just a matter of pronouncement of the laws of rights. It is a matter of her, of her very effectiveness in defending herself, speaking and acting for herself, and her readiness and the audaciousness to take on a fight, to live free or die free. She is a tiny titanium non-fish. That, that, that is the essence of the carapace or skid of power in which she is in case. Dictators like vultures, the proverb goes in the land that sired me. Dictators like vultures do not waste energy. They go where there are signs of death. In fact, if some of you have been to the Sahara Desert, you will know uh, what this is. If you walk in the Sahara Desert, you have to walk. We have to show signs of vitality when you walk. If you start slogging and moving around, you see the vultures, they already come around <laughs> waiting. <laughs> waiting because they know, they see the sign of death. Action to prevent uh, tyrants or slaves in so is not targeted at the community, but at individuals. This is guided by a proverb to the effect that uh, with the will be with literally a people are a people because of an individual. This run counter to what to off repeated uh, uh, saying that people attribute to all of Africa that we are I am because we are and since we are therefore I am. Here we have we are because of an individual as such. Then so society is seen as an additive community. One plus one plus one plus one and so on. What paved the way for the overarching theatrical kind of tyrant to destroy a society is the everyday tyrants. Everyday tyrants are those who kill the spirit of every of uh, of, of of everyday individual in the sphere that is often referred to in the Western world as private sphere, shielded from state gaze. Dictators, they feed on, on fear. They project fear, real or imagined. Here is how so gives an individual a shade of power, shielding her from the blaring desert sun and sandstorm. Of, uh, of course, the desert is a metaphor for dictators. How is how the, how it, here is how the shield or negative power is cultivated. The first thing that you notice in so is the ideal of self-reliance. The government of so made it the case that the earth is integral to human life. Buffeted by this proverb, should the earth die, I will die. And should I die, the earth will die. Every individual as an individual, woman, women included, and I emphasize women because in other parts of Africa, women are not allowed to own, they, they are not allowed to own property as such. Every individual is entitled to a portion of the earth to look after so he can provide her with shelter, with food and all the remains that give vitality and excitement to human life. The property become private, not to be traded, Entitlement to property is an insurance policy that obviates dependency on others and, by extension, everyday tyrant. Uh, the second way, we say they say in Sudan, so it's open for business. War at the base is about power. It's about taking from others what one wants. It's about taking people's stuff. In short, it is about domination of others with respect to sex, possession, and life. So, converted war into commerce as a new way of taking from others, but this time with some kind of compensation. Commerce allows every individual to enjoy positive and negative exercise of power, boost power. Commerce bootstrap the private property and uh, bootstrap by private property and competition is a central artery of life among the people of so. Now, here is the most important part of it. 
and this doesn't have to do. People ask, okay, where do you get the resource from? This is about, uh, uh, about safe, assertive spirituality. That is so important to the lives of my people, more than anything that you can imagine. And I want to start giving an idea how that spirituality looks like. Because the spirituality in the West is mainly the Abrahamic spiritualities and others that come from the East and the, and the Middle East. And so this is the kind of spirituality that we do not hear about in the Western world, in the Western world because it is not, uh, it's not one that involves missionaries going around to convert people. The basic premise of spirituality in so is that we, as an additive society, are here on our own. That's the basic premise. We are here on our own. In terms of power, there is no over. In terms of power, there is no overarching entity, human, superhuman, seen or unseen, looking over us and telling us what to do, and not do, and deciding who to kill, who to spare, and who to have sex with or allow others to. The word God of the Abrahamic variety did not enter our vocabulary until recently, almost around my lifetime. Even with the concept of God, there is a reminding proverb that you know, it's a weird. God is a person. Let me adumbrate the various way, way by which self assertive spirituality from a powerful share of power at the best. Fear of death. Power and fear of death are intricately connected. Man invented death to save political power. And that is why fear and ultimately the fear of death is the, is the mainstay of political power. To say that man invented death, I do not want to say that once upon a day it was invented, such that someone may ask for the dead when this happened. I'm saying that it's been invented now as we are speaking, through advertisement, through all sorts of ways. Police running around with cars, the army display, and all sorts of things. The imperative of death to political power is what Aristotle had in mind. When he said that a human being who is not afraid of death is either a beast or a god and does not belong to a political society. To say that man invented death is not to deny that human beings die. That's not what I mean. It is to say that unlike creatures, that unlike creatures like Fluffy the cat or Lucy the cat, <coughs> uh, human beings are very obsessed with death. For creatures like Lucy the cat, Life is here and now. In fact, life is timeless, and Lucy may as well be said to be living forever. Fear of death is one of the major causes of, of death, of which there is a store of rich vocabulary in my own language. There is a proverb which even a child can repeat at the slightest provocation that not death, but death in life is what, is what we, we regret, or what is regrettable. And the corollary is, is that not life, but life in life is what we cherish. It is clear that tyranny depend heavily on this fear to create their atrocities. And so we see the way that they saw spirituality deal with this idea of death in life because tyrants, they look for death, for, 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 for signs of lifelessness. And that's why even in the in in the in in this uh, in this movement that has sprung up around America, Black Lives Matter, it's a wonderful movement. It's better than nothing, but people can do better because some of the time we may ask, who are these people killing? Who are the people that are being killed? I mean, if you look at it very carefully, you see that there are a certain uh, kind or type of people. It might be that Black Lives Matter should focus on life in life. 
Focus on giving those people life. And not wait, because in America, I think what you get most is biological death is the kind of thing that you get people excited about. But some of the time, we don't even ask ourselves, who are these people that people are excited about? I mean, they are like walking cadavers most of the time. So that kind of death, biological death, we don't regret. What we regret is death in life. At the heart of the spirituality is broadening sacrifices of domestic animals. And this is meant to toughen the resolves of individual vis-a-vis -vis fear of death. Because people believe that blood, I mean they used to believe that blood is life. So if you get people used to blood, when the time comes they are not going to be afraid of it. And some of the time I regret because my people are so not afraid of death that when they come out, when there is something that allow them to go out and fight, then they don't come back. They will die to the last person. So I don't know whether uh, not fearing death is a good thing for that matter. As I said, life in life is what we cherish. Life is vitality, and vitality is a way of fending off human vultures who are always looking for signs of livelessness. So in this spirituality, if you can see, even in the, in the, old, in the new world, with uh, African American that are brought here, or you look at Africa, people are constantly dancing. There's a lot of dancing, there's a lot of singing, there's a lot of open air theater, and uh, all sort of physical movement. They are at the heart of the spirituality of vitality. You have to constantly move. In fact, people dance to their grave, my home. You see someone a hundred years old, they are still dancing. Because not to dance and not to move your body is what, what that is how you invite these vultures to you. And this is not only fiscal exertion. This is not about fiscal exertion only. Uh, it is also about mental exertion. You have to show vitality of the mind. And you show this by what you have done, inventing something. If you talk to people in my room, they will think that the person who invented, uh, they will call the person who invented antibiotics, they will call the person a god. They will call the person who invented the light bulb a god. They will call the person who invented, because that is spirituality. That is uh, vitality at its best. Those people, they send off tyrants, they never get closer to them in any form. And also in this society, money will be one of those things also. Never mind how you get it, but if you have the money, no one comes around. You know, and in fact, someone has told me that the best defense in America from uh, in this litigious society is not to have money. If you don't have money, no one comes, no one sue you. Yeah. <laughs> Another aspect of this spirituality is civic orthopedic. Civic orthopedic is the uprightness of statue that require one to manage upper body dynamic while walking despite <coughs> perturbation that are generated by the movement of the lower limbs. limbs. So the idea of standing erect with your spine straight, this is very, very important in this spirituality of vitality. In fact, uh, uh, walking erect and looking at people who you come in touch with directly on the forehead or what in India they call the fourth, the third uh, chakra is part and parcel of the pedagogy of freedom and this spirituality. In fact, this is even taught young people in my home. Young girls are taught to balance things on their head as they walk. It's not just about a hawking stuff. It, it, so that they can stand erect. Mm. That's why they do that. In fact, there are even public masquerade theater that teaches people to stand erect and don't slouch and don't move uh, and, don't, and not bending down. A person with the upright gait walking into a place produces the impression of her as a person to be reckoned with and not taken lightly. That is a pillar of the shade of power. Noble bearing is what we call in my home the safe application of social norms and rules. 
This is part of our spirituality. One must act and speak for herself and not through a mouthpiece as in relying on others to act and speak for one's on one's behalf. The safe application of norms, what we call a noble bearing, is because you respect the laws. And you can see even the nobility in Europe. You don't stop a noble and, and, and because as, as a noble. Or if you are a prince, you if they say if the if the sign says 30 miles an hour, you drive 30 miles. You don't drive more than that. And if there is an infraction, they, the police come to your house to come and talk to you at your home. They don't hum humiliate you in the public. And that is because of what we call noble bearing. And then the self-assertive spirituality does not leave room for accident in life. In fact, there is no word for accident in my language. Fatalism has zero place in the life of this spirituality. What happens and doesn't happen depends upon human action by commission or by omission. Seen in this light, talk of witchcraft, <coughs> talk of African witchcraft is a testament to the power that is imbued to a human being that for those who embrace Christianity and Islam can only be attributed to God and Satan. This spirituality is not admit of overarching overseer. Every family is entitled to their own ancestors. And, 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 and these ancestors are not mysterious at all. The same assertive spirituality vividly captures the deep meaning of freedom. This race species of control that does not dictate and mastery that does not dominate. Now, I say this about the topography of power and why it is that we have kings and we have queens. It is when you are somewhere higher than me that I can transcend myself by reaching up for you. That's simple. I must add that we cannot solve all human problems with political power alone but we cannot solve any of them without it. And we leave it here so we can talk about this some this provocative. Uh, so I mentioned I'm aware there are some people that have to leave early for another event, so um, I'm going to take questions in this moment, but let me just start by saying anyone who's going to have to leave soon has a question that they want to start with, or should I? Okay. Uh, we'll open things up. Do you want to call people? Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. Questions for Professor Wingo? Uh, how about here and then up here? Let's start with, yeah. Can you read the last, uh, that last little paragraph of your lecture? Uh, you mean the last? Yeah, there's a couple things I didn't catch. The one, uh, the one that, uh, that human problem cannot be, or that it is only when you yeah. are somewhere higher than me that I can trans transcend myself by reaching up for you, right? And yeah, or oh, there's the one that I say that uh, human problem cannot be resolved by power alone, that none of human power can be resolved without power. so sure about and I only ask this question because you talked about the Black Lives Matter movement and maybe yeah. you should focus more on life and giving people life yeah. and I already perceive that as like a life and life movement so I just want to know more yeah. about life that. and life movement <laughs> yeah. I think that's your life and life movement <laughs> uh, uh, I think uh, death in life uh, we have this vocabulary death in life <coughs> death in death immortality mm -hmm. life in life life in death we have all this series of vocabulary in my home, and that's because that's the center of our spirituality. I think the, the idea of uh, uh, life, there is life which we share with all the, 
organisms, animals together, which is biological life. But the life in life is what is above that biological life. Yet, for lack of a better word, I talk about the aesthetic life or the, uh, the enjoyment of the useless things of life. You know, the adornment of the body, you know, the having in America shopping. <laughs> right? Shopping. Even having the opportunity to be sued. <laughs> right? You know, and spending time <clears throat> like at the state house, you know, sitting around, uh, wringing your hands and uh, over problems that we face, right? Hiking, doing yoga, right? In in here, these are the these are the kind of thing that I talk about life in life. That is above life, but death in life is the absence of all these things. When they are gone, then that's what I say that you become a walking cadaver. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, <coughs> such a person is like a zombie, and such a person attracts the vultures. Not just the, not just the police. You know, that's why God even said that he who has <laughs> more shall be given to them. And he who has nothing, even the nothing that they don't have shall be taken away. If you don't have, you, all you have is your life. And when it's your life, the only thing that you have, then it's over. Yes. So yes. Yes. That, yes. That's my thought. I, I get the Don't idea of like, yes. yeah, a politically qualified life, right? That you know, even if you're biologically alive, you may not be a participant in society. Um, so it sounds like because of Black Lives Matter, so you're more recommending that they find ways to preempt these tragedies rather than mostly responding. Yes, okay. that's what I mean. So yeah. here, here's my question then about that. So given that these tragedies are very visceral and people can rally behind it because there's like a picture of the person and they've already passed away, yes. the question is what sort of things do you see as equally motivated to stimulate public action that aren't really as graphic as like that martyrdom experience? Like how are you going to motivate people to be more proactive without like horrible things happening? I think we already do it somehow in the United States. There was uh, a president who declared war on poverty. Who was it? Johnson. 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 War on poverty. There, is, there are movements where people are, you can, you can have churches. Churches. Missionaries, they are going to, to uh, a, a, a Appalachian Mountain, you know, with all people. And, really trying to do things there with people. They are not waiting for the police to kill them. They, 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 they leveling the people up. They, you see? So the idea that, and, and in this, in, uh, and the world knows this about America very well, particularly Africa. They know that what America cares so much about is this kind of uh, biological life. When you ask what's the problem in America, they just count everybody, okay? And I think they should. But they know this. And so the, the, the kind of uh, killing that goes on a day in America is unimaginable. Once you start adopting <coughs> this mindset about death and life, okay? Anytime when we're sitting here, you look around here, 13% of this room should be African-Americans should be Hispanic, should be this. They are not here. This is a flagship of, of, uh, of the, of, of, uh, this is a flagship university of Colorado. They are not here. So what I'm saying is, there are many that are killed on a daily basis. But that, you don't see that. Just then now, then the police shoot somebody. And then America will swing a battle axe against the person, and then you hear all the noises. And the dictators in the third way they know this. Nowadays, they, don't, they will not kill anybody. They know you don't shoot anybody. What you do is you just take the shade off from these people and render them into walking cadavers. And with those people, and, uh, with those people living around, in fact, this was done a lot in, uh, in, uh, in uh, African 
many African countries, even including my own country, what the what the what the what the tyrants discovered was that if you allow people with life in life, you stand, you are always sitting at the edge of your chair. And so it used to be that if you wanted to leave an African country, most African countries, you have to get an exit visa. You take, because education was free, you tell people when you are going to come back, what you are going to do, and you pay fee. Then dictators discover that these people, they are giving them a lot of trouble. And what did they do? They say, okay, now democracy, freedom, freedom of movement, everyone can live. And passport became for free, and everybody left. <laughs> and what do you have there? You have these people sitting there like zombies. A lot of them. They are all in Europe. If you look at the United States and you look at the countries, in a, the, the, you look at the educational level of countries, of people uh, supplying immigrants into the United States, Africa stands top above Asia, above everybody. Yes. Yes, uh, I think this is, I, I don't think that this was much clearer as I wanted to be. Uh, the uh, power, as I mentioned, and political power, power, I mentioned, is really the human ability, or not just the ability, the taking away of people's life, right? Uh, not just that, controlling people's sex and sexuality and controlling people's possession, domination. That's what it is. Political power, when this is adorned, when it's institutionalized, when it's all surrounded with traitors, then you get political. It's still the same thing. I mean, if you want to tell me otherwise. And, and you can see uh, uh, in a following this spirituality of vitality, why it is that many people will be attracted to certain personalities in politics. So policy is not about institutions, it's about personalities. If you start thinking in terms of power, certain personalities that show vitality, people are going to be attracted to those personalities than one that doesn't. And so if this is visceral, it is within us because you look at this person, even when they are being destructive, uh, because they have the vitality, you see this personality as the kind of personality that you want to emulate, the kind of personality that you want to be, the kind of personality that can protect you, protect themselves and you. And that is very important when you're thinking about even politics in, 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 the, in, in, uh, in modern liberal democracy. Yes. Yes. Um, to some extent, especially in a smaller, like face to face community. But what about, say, the political dissident who gets shot be precisely because, or gets ordered to be executed because he's a political dissident? Um, you know, he's got a lot of vitality, he or she. Yes. You know, in expressing uh, opposition and, and really a lot of bravery. And I can't really think of somebody who would be more um, uh, sort of this ideal that you're describing of. Life is life. Yes. Uh, and yet they get shot anyways, and they get shot because they're they have that vitality. So their shield didn't really, uh, if anything, their shield uh, drew. Yes. <laughs> drew the uh, yes. sword. Yes. <coughs> yeah, she drew the sword. Yes. Yeah. How, what would you say to that? Yes. Uh, uh, um, so you say you can see how this work in the face-to-face -face society. I would tell you this that. In fact, and, uh, and this, I didn't, I didn't want to say it. I wanted someone to realize this by themselves. If you look at liberal democracies, it is precisely, it is the secret of it, is handing to many people these shields. And in the Western world, it's in the form of rights. The right, the read of the Hebrew 
the, the right against privacy, <coughs> property rights, all these rights. In fact, these rights, they are not just, they are not just pronouncement, they actually work. And having courts to adjudicate this. <coughs> and I think that uh, in, in this case, this is where, this is why that the difference between the Western world and African states is precise for this, the prayer because of this. And now, what happened is that when this start going down, that is when a state commit suicide. And I think that the only way that the Western world, a place like America, could ever go down is if they commit this kind of suicide. No one can come from outside and do this. That's one part of it. The second part is about someone whose vitality, uh, whose uh, uh, vitality allowed, uh, attract, you know, them to be killed. I think still we say in my home that our, that that it is it is uh, death in life that we we fear, and those those sacrifices that I was talking about, bloodletting sacrifice and all of these things. That's what allow them to be fearless. And one of the reasons why when you are fearless is that your life become, you are more or less above power. Your life become more like the life of Fluffy the cat. Whereby life is here now, not yesterday, not tomorrow. Time is not an issue. And I think that these people, they kiss death and this in my home, we say they kiss their death. They are not afraid. Yes. Okay. And then, yes. So you don't know oh, distinguish. Okay. <laughs> so you don't know this distinction between you know life and life and, and death and life. And I think I think that's a common thing when you're when you're young. You you experience a sort of life and life thing, right? I don't think any young people really lack that. But then there's, there's this kind of transition that happens. Career and age and experience. Um, how? What sort of remedies do you recommend to if you if you experience a sort of like you know you're in the doldrums of I've been in this career for 20 years I know the whole thing it's easy to do I'm not gaining I'm not growing anymore personally from this. Um, what do you recommend to sort of transition back to this life and life state? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the reason why you experience in that is because part of the reason, like I say, it's not just about physical; it's also about the mental. You want to keep your, your, your mind alive. And, and societies like where I come from, this is done uh, practically on a daily basis. And you get this because of uh, when we think about politics. You were there, you, you came to my kingdom, and uh, we didn't have the chance to witness a lot. But you will have seen all the li little associations around and the, the participation by everybody. In fact, the idea of Usaima is sure. People say we don't live long enough. I mean, that's what people want to say. It's not really true. Partly it's because of the dormancy of the mind. People, I see people in old homes who just sit there. They don't use their mind anymore. But the idea of stimulating your mind is very important as you get older, you even need that more and more. And you get this when you participate in politics, when you see that one of the things that people regret a lot in the rest of the world, that they fight for, is, not, is, is that they don't have the ability to sit in and solve the problem that involved them. And sitting, I mean, men has done this in the Western world. They say women stay home, we go to work. Women stay home, we go to the military. Women stay home, that is really, if you talk about uh, the kind of uh, 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 crime against, it's not, this not crime against humanity, it's crime against life. When you say women stay home, we go to war. Uh, because that vitality, that's where you get it in activities. In fact, there is a, there is a story in my home about to show you the importance of political participation. They, all the animals and birds, and they came together to discuss the affairs of the land. 
And each time, the rooster, is the rooster the chicken? The rooster was always missing. Each time they go, the rooster either come late or have a reason to leave early. <laughs> and, and this happened perpetually. And one day, the ancestors asked that they needed sacrifice. And all the people and um, they are all baffled. And they all came together and they were sitting there having meetings day and night. Day and night at one point, they started calling. Okay, they call the mice, the, the mouse, the mouse comes say not me. They call the deer, the deer say not me. They call horses, and they've done this until at the end, everyone was giving hope and they are all tired. Then someone remember that the rooster has not been called. They call the rooster and the rooster wasn't there. And they say from that day, <laughs> you will be the sacrifice one. And that's why in my home there's a place where we pass through where the exile people is called stupid. Yes. Stupid. <laughs> These are the, the, dead, the dead in life. You know, you're stupid when you don't participate in politics. In fact, the word idiot comes from this kind of war, from idiot, people that don't participate in the affairs that concern them. I'm saying that we don't want to reach a point where we say the elders are excluded. Even when you are 100 years, 110 years, you should sit in the court with everybody else. And that's why this spirituality is so diverse, is so everywhere, as against the Abrahamic spirituality, where then you have the priest, you have this, and they have to gather in one place, and all of that. Yes? So I wanted to try to provoke you a little bit, because yes, I mean, it seems like you're very much in support of civil liberties, negative freedom, and also like grassroots civic organizations and allowing them to flourish and like establish these relations of legitimized power, right? But you also described about these horrible dictatorships that cripple any of those opportunities. Yes. So the question is really like, what are you actually prescribing for the people in those? Because I hear your argument about regime change that like if you just replace them, it'll get worse. <laughs> but for the people in those situations, are you basically just telling them like, hey, Wait it out, because if you interfere, it's going to be worse. Wait a couple of generations, and then things will start to sort themselves out. Is that what you're advocating? Well, I'm not really advocating for people to wait. There's no waiting here, actually. To wait is death. Well, I mean, if they're like... So not so now. I, I, I get where you are going with this. I think this is the same question that John Stuart Mill was asked. You know, how are you going to get people to the point where they can have liberty? John Stuart Mill said, well, this liberty is for people that already have it. <laughs> don't have it. And then Plato also faced this kind of problem. How are you going to get people to this? Oh, we tell a noble lie. You know, we, we pass the expulsion decree and expel everybody above the age of 10 out of the city, take the kids and mom. You have this kind of view. This, this is engineering question. It's uh, more of the question for technicians of politics. All right, we'll, we'll work. We'll <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, yeah. um, have you given any thought, because you talked about education and habeas corpus, and what, the fact that we have systems here within our country of common law that we can sort of fight for our rights in that, in that way, sort of preserve our life and light. Mm -hmm. Or have you given any thought about certain systems that we've implemented in our country that have allowed the republic to continue? What I'm thinking about, for example, a check on power and an ability to allow people to live life on life is through federalism. The fact that when we see the federal government, like somehow people see today as Trump being too powerful, being able, trying to tear down systems, states are able to make their own laws aside from the federal government. Likewise, we have checks and separations of power horizontally <coughs> through the legislative precedent and the judicial system to check on power. Have you given any thought about these checks on power sort of sort of shield? Yes, I have given a lot of thought. And most of the time when we think about checks, checks checks and balances, yeah. we think about it in terms of the government. Yeah. But in fact, these checks and balances should go down to the house, to your own house. You know, a, a, for example, when someone build a house in my home, you build your house, it's not, you have to call people to come one way or the other and participate in it. That is a form of check or you want to call the balances for people who come in and try to question. When they question, everybody come out, we build this house together. It's no longer you. 
Uh, yeah, uh, and so, yes, there is the idea. What, what I'm saying is, do not try to bring down the people at the top. If you bring one down, another one sprung up. That's what the woman, uh, in uh, the woman who was talking about that, this was talking about. You bring one down, you get the worst one. So relying on this will never solve anything. So, and that is the idea that we should give people the, sh the, the share. The, 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 that's the shade of power. Put everyone under the shade. Basically, take one individual at a time. And not forget about that because when you have, like I showed the diagram here, when I showed that diagram, uh, one of the things that I did, yeah, I can draw it here. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I did was that I had this one. This is, this is what I, this is the, the sword. So you have this hierarchy here with top people. If you look at this, you can know who is, if you can look at this very carefully in every society, you know who is dominating who. You know, you have few on top, you know, many in between and a lot below here. Now, this here, this is where, this is, Doing unto others. These are the section where you do unto others. Now, as I said, what tyrants care a lot about and government care a lot about. For example, when you see someone like Amy, Amy doesn't, or Susan, Susan, you don't aim. You, your aim is not to dominate anybody. You just don't, you don't, you don't want to be dominated. That's all you want, to be left alone. You don't want to dominate anybody. And that's it. when I say we, that we, that we level everybody up, what I'm saying is that from here we give as many people as we can that share. And when you give this share to people, then the sword become more ceremonial than anything else. And that is in a way, you can get this in the Western world, in the way in my home, where I come from, as uh, my, uh, my family, as uh, you would have noticed, uh, Kenna Michelle, and you came to my home, we don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't carry, there's no bodyguard anyway. In fact, the king is ceremonial more than anything else. There's no bodyguard, there are no guns carrying, there is nothing. We can walk around, partly because there is nothing that they can do. We cannot, we are not in a position to do unto others. What others cannot do unto us. That's what Saddam Hussein, uh, Gaddafi and the rest they are doing. And then the day comes. And human beings are approximately equal, <laughs> equal, by the way. In strength, yes. So to kind of paraphrase that. Yes, yes. You're, you're saying that like if a regime maybe something more like the British monarchy, where just with time it becomes kind of more neutralized and ceremonious, and you don't disrupt that organization, but there's like a whole other level of civic engage engagement that actually does secure like the democratic process. And sort of well, if the regime were to change, it would look as boring as Sweden. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Sweden is a very interesting place. You know, in Sweden, I mean, you, if you've been to Sweden, you'll see, even Australia, Susan, your country, and mine. Even Australia is one of those uh, countries where you don't have this brutal exercise of power that much, you know. So you, it, it become more like that. It, it become like Britain, like like the British monarchy, more more than anything else. But more so, it become like not. Uh, we don't want to talk about the country here. But you th think about Sweden, think about Switzerland, think about, yes, you know. I, I have a question yes. for you. Uh, you mentioned these 55 nations in Africa. Yes. Uh, all having these. Uh, Coup d'etat. Yeah, and tyrannical. What are the factors that you think lead to that in Africa rather than elsewhere in the world? I, mean, I know it's happened elsewhere yes. in the world. Yes, yes. There seems to be a concentration of that in Africa. Uh -huh. You also mentioned uh, that there are some countries where they've not had that 
that rule, but mm -hmm. I would argue that they've displayed that in other ways, like the Zuma government in South Africa, stealing the riches from the people, yes. and feathering the nests of a very few. What are the factors that you think contribute to that? Yeah, of part of the factor, one of the factors, and I know them as many, one of them is, I think, uh, I believe, do you work on colonial studies or something like that? Part of the, part of the problem is that in uh, the way that, uh, the way that the, the worst thing about colonialism, about the creation of these states in Africa, was that what the, what the, of course, imperialism is the highest manifestation of power and colonialism. You come around, you take people's stuff, you decide how they should live their life and all of that. And, and, and that is what, that's one of the factors that was created. And when the colonialists came, what they did, if you look across Africa, there is rarely anywhere where a member of the royal family was taken to rule any of the countries. In fact, where you get something that comes closer to it is Nelson Mandela, whose father was a member of the court of Islam. And he led, so people that you get to rule are the kind of people that you can say that they are, they have suffered some death in life. And those people, when they are afraid, they tend to be brutal. They tend to brutal, not, they tend to kill people. That's what Church Hill was talking about. They tend to kill a lot. Not because they really want to kill, but because they want to shield themselves from being killed. So I think that is one of the factors. Another factor is that they, as I said, the African states, one of, when they thought, of, when they sit and look into themselves, they, to look into a kingdom like my home, which is like the Athens, I would say, my own Athens, is to look, is to be backward. What they thought, these people, taken in by missionaries and all of this, what they taught them was that life is somewhere else. You know, to be civilized is to look out. So the tendency is looking out. And when they look out for how things can be different, they see the French Revolution bringing down tyrant. When they look how things can be different, they see, they hear communism, which the manifesto, all bourgeois down. When they think about how things can be different, they see how United States go to place and bring